The Carte Noir Readers, your moment of indulgence. John Sim reads Crime and Punishment by Fyodor Dostoevsky. So, are you sitting comfortably? Then I'll begin. Just then, the door opened quietly, and a certain young girl entered the room, looking timidly around her. They all turned towards her in surprise and curiosity. It took Raskolnikov a glance or two before he recognized her. This was Sofia Semyonovna Mamaladova. He had seen her the evening before, but such had been the moment, the surroundings, and her manner of dress that his memory had retained the image of someone very different. Now she was modestly and even poorly dressed, and she looked very young, almost like a little girl. With a modest and demure manner and a clear but rather frightened-looking face, she was wearing a very plain little house dress, and on her head there was an old-fashioned bonnet of a kind that is no longer worn. The only item of yesterday's costume was the parasol, which she held in one hand. Having suddenly realized that the room was full of people, she was less embarrassed than completely at a loss, as intimidated as a small child, and she even made a movement as if to go away again. Oh, it's you," Raskolnikov said, extremely surprised, and was suddenly himself thrown off balance. It immediately occurred to him that his mother and sister must already have picked up some knowledge in passing from Luchin's letter about an unmarried woman of immoral conduct. Only just now he had been protesting against Luchin's slanderous remarks, mentioning that he had seen the woman for the first time on the day in question, and now here she was. He remembered too that he had raised no protest against Luchin's use of the expression "of immoral conduct." All this slipped through his head obscurely in an instant. Giving her a closer look, however, he suddenly perceived that this humiliated creature was so humble that he felt sorry for her, and when she made that movement to flee in terror, something in him seemed to turn over. I wasn't expecting you at all," he said hurriedly, stopping her with his gaze. "Please be so good as to sit down. I expect you've come from Katerina Ivanovna. No, not over here. Please, sit there." When Sonya had come in, Razumikin, who was sitting on one of Raskolnikov's three chairs right beside the door, had got up in order to allow her into the room. At first, Raskolnikov had been about to ask her to sit down in the corner of the sofa where Zosimov had sat, but reflecting that his sofa was rather too. Familiar a spot as it served him as a bed, he hastily directed her to Razumikin's chair. "And you sit here," he said to Razumikin, motioning him to sit down in the corner Zosimov had occupied. Sonia sat down, almost shivering with terror, and gave the two ladies a timid look. It was evident that she herself had not the faintest idea of how she could possibly have sat down beside them. Having pondered this, she grew so frightened. That she suddenly got up again and, in complete confusion, turned to Raskolnikov. I, I've only dropped in for a moment. Forgive me for disturbing you," she said falteringly. "I've come from Katerina Ivanovna. There was no one else she could send. She told me to say that she would be very glad if you would come to the funeral tomorrow morning, for the service at the Mitrofaniev Cemetery, and then to our home, to her home, afterwards to take some food." You would be doing her an honor," she told me to ask you. Sonia faltered and was silent. "I'll certainly see if I can. Certainly," Raskolnikov replied, who had also got up and was also faltering his sentence unfinished. "Look, do me the favor of sitting down," he said suddenly. "I want to talk to you, please. I, I know you're probably in a hurry, but do me this favor and give me two minutes of your time." And he moved up a chair for her. Sonia sat down. Again, gave the two ladies a quick look of timid embarrassment, and suddenly lowered her gaze. Raskolnikov's pale face flushed; he seemed to convulse all over; his eyes caught fire. "Mother," he said firmly and insistently, "this is Sofia Semyonovna Marmeladova, the daughter of poor Mr. Marmeladov, the man whom I saw run down by the horses yesterday, and whom I have already told you about, Bulkaria Alexandrovna." Glanced at Sonia and narrowed her eyes at her slightly, in spite of all her confusion before Roger's insistent and challenging stare. She could on no account deny herself this satisfaction. 
Dunya had battened her gaze earnestly and directly on the poor girl's face and was examining her with perplexity. On hearing the introduction, Sonia looked up again, but this time grew even more embarrassed. What I wanted to ask you, Raskolnikov said, turning to her, is how you've managed to cope with things today. Have you had any trouble? From the police, for example? No, sir, it all went... I mean, it's only too plain to see what caused his death. No one's given us any trouble. Except the other lodgers, they're angry with us. Why? Because the body's lying out too long. I mean, it's so hot just now, there's a smell. So they're taking it to the cemetery today, before Vespers, to lie in the chapel until tomorrow. Katerina Ivanovna didn't want them to at first, but now she sees herself that it won't do. So they're moving it today, are they? Yes, and she wants you to do the honour of coming to the funeral service tomorrow, and then attending the funeral repast at her home. She's arranging the funeral repast? Yes, sir. Some zakuski. She told me to thank you very much for coming to our assistance yesterday. It, if it hadn't been for you, we'd never have been able to find the money to bury him. Both her lips and her chin suddenly began to dance but she mastered and restrained herself, quickly lowering her eyes to the ground again. During the course of their conversation, Raskolnikov studied her fixedly. This was a thin, very thin, and pale little face, rather irregular and sharp, with a sharp small nose and chin. One could certainly not have called her pretty, but on the other hand her blue eyes were so clear and when they grew animated, the expression of her face became so kind and open-hearted that one felt oneself involuntarily drawn to her. There was about her face, moreover, as about all the rest of her, one peculiar distinguishing feature. In spite of her eighteen years, she still looked more or less like a little girl, far younger than she was almost a complete child, and occasionally, in some of her movements, this made itself almost absurdly evident. But can Katerina Ivanovna really manage all this on such limited means? She's even planning Zakuski, Raskolnikov asked, insistently continuing the conversation. Well, the coffin's to be a simple one, sir, and the whole thing will be simple, so it won't cost much. Katerina Ivanovna and I worked it all out earlier on so that there would be enough left for a meal in his memory. And Katerina Ivanovna very much wants you to be there. And Katerina Ivanovna very much wants there to be one. I mean, one can't... That consolation, I mean, that's the way she is, sir. You, you know her. I understand, I understand, of course. Why are you staring at my room like that? You know, my mother says it looks like a coffin. You gave us all the money you had yesterday, Sonia said suddenly by way of reply, in a kind of loud, hurried whisper, and then with equal suddenness lowered her eyes as far as she could. Her lips and chin began to dance again. Ever since she had come in, she had been struck by Raskolnikov's impoverished surroundings, and now these words broke from her suddenly of their own accord. A silence ensued. Dunya's eyes brightened a little. And Pulkaria Alexandrovna even gave Sonia a friendly look. Roger, she said, getting up, it goes without saying that we'll have dinner together. Come along, Dunya. And you ought to go out for a bit of a walk, Roger. After that, have a rest, lie down for a while, and then come to see us as soon as you can. Otherwise, I'm afraid we'll have tired you out. Yes, yes, I'll come, he replied, getting up and starting to bustle about. Actually, there's some business I have to attend to. I say, you're not going to have dinner on your own, are you? Razumikin exclaimed, looking at Raskolnikov in astonishment. What are you up to? Yes, yes, I'll come. Don't worry, don't worry. Anyway, I want you to stay for a minute. After all, you don't need him right now, do you, mother? Or am I perhaps depriving you of him? Oh, no, no. Now then, Dmitri Prokovich, you will come and dine with us too, won't you? Please do, Dunya said entreatingly. Razumikin bowed. Or rather, until we meet. I don't like saying goodbye. <laughs> goodbye, Nastasia. Oh, there, I said it again. Bulgaria Alexandrovna intended to bow to Sonia as well, but somehow failed to get round to it and made a bustled exit from the room. 
Advotia Romanovna, on the other hand, had evidently been waiting her turn, and as she walked past Sonia in the wake of her mother, made her an attentive, polite, and completely formed bow. Sonia grew flustered, bowed back in a hurried, frightened sort of way, and a look of pain appeared in her features, as though she found Advotia Romanovna's politeness and attention distressful and tormenting. Goodbye, Dunya! Raskolnikov shouted when they were already out on the stairs. Give me your hand! But I've already given it to you, remember? Dunya replied, turning round to face him affectionately and awkwardly. Never mind, let me take it again. And he squeezed her fingers tightly. Dunya smiled at him, blushed, quickly extricated her hands from his, and followed her mother downstairs, also for some reason thoroughly happy. Well, there's a glorious thought, he said to Sonia as he came back to his room, giving her a bright look. May the Lord grant rest to the souls of the dead, and let life be the realm of the living. That's right, isn't it? Isn't it? Don't you think so? Sonia looked at his suddenly brightened features with positive wonderment. For a few split seconds, he stared at her silently and fixedly. At that moment, all the things her dead father had told him about her suddenly passed through his memory. Rich and velvety carte noire for a more seductive coffee break.